isn't this great weather, you guys? Isn't this awesome? I mean, the two hottest Sundays of the year, God's given us cloud cover. Isn't that awesome? You know, I mean, we have people sitting out here, not even under shade canopies. They're just enjoying the weather. So we just want to give a shout out to all of you pansy, I mean, saints out there who chose, sorry, I didn't say it. I didn't say it. <laughs> but anyway, we're, we're here to have a good time this morning. And I'm, I love this series that we're in on The Rock Vision. And as you can see behind me, we have discipling leaders that transform culture, identity, community, and mission. And uh, this, this comprised, this statement on this banner is what it means to go to the rock, to be a rock partner, and to participate in the vision that this church has for everyone who attends here. As leadership at the rock, and due to the influence of many people over the years, this is the vision that we have come to, that we are a family where everyone can come to the rock and not spectate, but participate. Participate in building the kingdom, building it through community, belonging to a kingdom family on mission, doing the work of the ministry, as Faith read in Ephesians chapter 4, and participating in the process, sacrificing, laying down our lives for that. That's what we are called to do. And uh, it is important to note that whether we're talking about identity and our relationship with God or community and our relationships with people in the body or mission, our relationships with people who need to experience the love of God, it's all about relationship. Life is about people. The kingdom is about people, not things. And relationships with intentional rhythms makes life about people. So it's important for us to intentionally realize in our hearts the importance of these kingdom relationships. And it is relationship that inexorably links identity, community, and mission together. Even though those are three separate arenas, it is the concept of relationship that God is keen on. Jesus did not die on the cross for anything but people. And to unify people together, we are stronger together. We're better together. You can be better, stronger, faster. You can be a bionic believer. Okay, so this is important that we realize that this is the call that God has on our lives. If we are casual about our relationships, then we're casual about the kingdom. If we're intentional about our relationships, then we're intentional about the kingdom. This is important to understand. So that's a brief review of, of what we've been doing in this series and this morning, I want to talk to you about the chemistry of community. Now, this is uh, something that God shared with me to discuss a couple of weeks ago, and I had no idea what was going to unfold in the process. But because I'm the community pastor here and I talk a lot about community, I just didn't want to regurgitate a bunch of the same stuff that I've said over and over again. And so I want to read something to you. It is the definition of chemistry, and this is very interesting. It is the branch of science that deals with identification of substances of which matter is composed, the investigation of their properties, and the ways in which they interact with each other when combined and change, and the use of these processes to form new substances. So I want to point your attention to something. As I read that again, I want to show you something that I saw in this. Chemistry is the branch of science that deals with the identification of those substances of which matter is composed, the investigation of their properties and the ways in which they interact 
okay? And the use of these processes when you combine these substances, mission. Identity, community, and mission is in the definition of chemistry. And that's important to realize. This building behind me here is a combination of substances and, and that have been put together. From the concrete to the steel to the plastics to the wiring, everything is a combination of raw substances that have been combined and when combined and being used together form something far greater than they would have ever been as the dust of the earth. And that's why 2,300 years ago, Aristotle said, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Because those substances have been combined together, they have created something much greater than dirt and rock could have ever been in the earth. This is important. Recently, uh, Pastor Bob made a statement to me, and this is the, the concept of combining substances together. Jesus didn't choose 12 men who were like himself. He chose 12 people that were different because two of the same substance together mean nothing. You just get more of the same. They have to be different. And two of two different substances mingling together can, conform, can uh, form a whole new entity. Now, interestingly enough, there's another definition for chemistry. It's this, the complex emotional or physiological or psychological, and I would add spiritual interaction between people. That's another definition for chemistry. We're talking about relational chemistry now, how people connect with each other, just like Jesus did with the apostles that Pastor Bob referenced. Just as there are interactions between those compounds that make that building, there are interactions between people that make a greater plan and a greater purpose. We are stronger together. This is the chemistry of the kingdom, the chemistry of community. That when we join together, something happens that the whole becomes greater, the body of Christ, than the sum of its parts. I've always loved Philemon 1.6. May the fellowship of your faith become effective through the true knowledge of every good thing that is in you for Christ's sake. That means when I come together with Ben and we're sharing the word of God together, the true knowledge of every good thing that is in me for Christ's sake, and then Ben either affirms or adds to that and that chemistry takes place, we both become more together than we are separately. Now imagine the context of a kingdom family, and that's how we look at our community groups, to help people find a family outside of these four walls. That's where real church happens. It is the chemistry of our faith, and in community, this is how powerful community is. In community, we can turn our belief systems into lifestyles. Not just a concept, but a reality. Because we're ministering to each other and fellowshipping and supporting one another. We can turn our belief systems into lifestyles, our acquaintances into relationships, and our casual lives into intentional ones. But it takes intentionality. In community is one of the primary ways where the word becomes flesh in our lives. Again, we are truly stronger together. Now I know 
that as many people as we have out here, we've had that many different experiences in community. Some are good and some are bad. But let me just submit this to you. We don't get to define the glory of true biblical community by our experiences. Right? One person thinks I'm right. Can I just make sure I'm on track here? We don't get to define kingdom by our experience. That would sell it short. God will define it for us, what it should be, and then it's up to us to apply our faith to that expectation and work toward that end. And that's why I love Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. This is a powerful statement of what the kingdom should look like. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. So Paul starts out this passage just by saying, look, if you want to know what it looks like to really walk in the faith and to do the things that Jesus prioritizes, then I'm going to explain how you do that, how you walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. So he goes on and he says, with all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. Why do we need to bear with one another in love? Because there's this thing called relational chemistry. And sometimes it gets a little ugly, right? Sometimes it gets a little challenging. But we are supposed to bear through that, continue on. Some of the most challenging relationships I've had in my life, like Pastor Bob, for example. No, just kidding. <laughs> have, have, no, but some of the relationships I've, that I've had that have been really challenging God has said, told me, stay with it, stay with it. There is, you will see my glory at the other end of this. And in doing that, I have learned so much from being around those people that have rubbed me the wrong way. And there has ultimately been a chemistry that has been so powerful where both of us were elevated in our faith and our paradigms and how we see things. It's very powerful. Bearing with one another in love. Eager to maintain the unity of of the spirit and the bond of peace. Well, here's, here's what's powerful about this. The unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. How does that happen? Well, it happens because we are united by purpose and vision. If we're all thinking the same way about vision, if we're all thinking and saying the same thing and doing the same thing and doing is good, we were recreated in Christ Jesus unto good works. So doing is good. If we all have the same mindset and we're united around these three principles, that's when revival breaks out. That's when God's glory shows up, when we're all willing to sell out to this vision. It is a powerful concept. In the uniting of this vision, listen to this next passage of Scripture about the singularity that Paul declares in this uniting. He goes on to say, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father who is over all, through all, and in all. The singularity here is powerful. It draws us all together to the same conclusion. And I might add, it's a very offensive one. I don't know if you realize that. When people know you believe that you worship the one true God, that is extremely offensive. And I, for one, am not really one of those who's really keen on, let's try 
to make the church as much like the world as we possibly can so that the world is comfortable with coming into the church because a lot of new age and unbiblical thinking has crept its way into the church and many have fallen away from the faith because they've tried to in some way accommodate the mindset of the world. But that's darkness and light. The Bible says that we formally walked according to the prince of the power of the air. That's darkness. The spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Now, we're supposed to walk in love and be as, as, as attractive as we possibly can as far as it depends on the divine nature that is flowing through us. But in what we say and what we believe, we are supposed to hold fast. And by the way, when you go to China or countries that are persecuted for their faith, they're not being persecuted because they dress differently or they pray differently. They're being persecuted because of this. There is one body. There's no other body. There's one spirit. There's no other spirit. We were called to one hope. It is useless to hope in anything else but Christ. There's one Lord, precious Jesus. One faith, one baptism, one God who is the father of us all and is over all and through all and in all. And it doesn't matter what you do, the very thing that unites us, these very concepts that the, the Paul is challenging us to unite around and become one in is the very thing that is the most offensive to people in the world. Yet he's calling us to unite around these things. And it doesn't matter how nice you try to be the core of our faith is offensive and we can't let that go. And then Paul says, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And he gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So God here sets up the biblical structure for the spiritual chemistry that is supposed to make the church thrive. The Bible says Christ ascended into heaven in this passage of scripture, that he gave gifts to men, then he organizes them in a structure. Why did God do that? Why did Christ do that? The answer is simple and clear in this passage. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Our goal here at The Rock is not that you would watch us do this from the pulpit or in classes or in, in uh, online workshops, but that you would engage the process of community and participate in the process of building up the body of Christ. Because it is true. I heard this statement many years ago. You can build a church and not make disciples. But you can't make disciples and not build the church. That's what the kingdom is about. It's about the chemistry between us. How we come together and we join together on mission to build God's kingdom. And to do this, we're going to have to make relationships a priority. That's what the kingdom is about. And then he goes on to say, until we all attain, this is the end game, until we all. So Paul's saying all of this that's happened up until now is for these three things to occur at the end of this, this uh, process. Until we all attain 
to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So here's God's end game right here, that we're all unified. So we come together in community, the goal, the sign of maturity, the sign that we are accomplishing God's will for our lives is that we are, are unified in kingdom families in the body of Christ. That's the goal. And it goes on to say, to the knowledge of the Son of God. So we have unity and we have knowledge of the Son of God. And it is in community where the knowledge of the Son of God is processed, developed, and reaches a full understanding and becomes more real within us as to who God is and what he is. And then what happens? It is to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What does that mean? It means to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ that how Jesus would stand before you. His stature. What comes out of Jesus. His... It, it would come out of me, his fullness. That we would become more like Jesus through unity, the knowledge of God, and then we would stand in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, obviously, that's a lifelong uh, goal and something that realistically won't attain until we get to heaven. But God is inviting us into a process filled with grace, not condemnation. So there's time and room to grow together as a body. It is an invitation into a series of divine relationships that form Christ in us. It's seasoned with grace and in the context of God's patience. So we're invited into the journey. We're invited into the process. And one of the primary ways in the Bible we enter that process is into community through relationships. That is true discipleship. Now, as I get ready to, to land the plane here, I want to give you a personal testimony it was this last week that I was in fellowship with a brother in the Lord. And he challenged me, really confronted me on that he felt that I had developed a hardness of heart in a certain area. And the minute the words left his lips, I knew he was telling me the truth. I knew I was struggling with something, but I really didn't have it defined for me. Now, first of all, I value that. There is this concept in biblical fellowship called invitation and challenge. It's where we see Jesus say, follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. Invitation and challenge. And a lot of Christians like the invitation. They don't like the challenge, <laughs> right? So I value that. When somebody speaks to me in my life, I embrace that. I, I've, hey, it's hard to find friends that are willing to do that with you. So I value that when that happens. So he challenged me with hardness of heart. And so it took me a few days to really figure out what the hardness in my heart was located, where, what it was directed towards, and then how to begin the process of repenting, calling on the grace of God to soften my heart in that area and to look at things re, re, in relationship to that in a new perspective. Now, most of the time when we get confronted, we'll, oh, that's not me, without even thinking about it or considering it. Let me give you a little tip. Never reject confrontation. Always consider it. Consider the possibilities. It might take you a week to figure out that it's actually true, but if you respond immediately 
with, oh, that's not me, then you're too quick. You haven't really considered it. Just as my heart could become hard, if I were to allow that to go, it would make me indifferent to community. If I were to allow that to grow and fester, it would have taken me out of community. And just like this building, I would have ended up being a fraction of what I was called to be without being in community. As the, uh, if I were to quit mingling with other people and experiencing the ongoing uh, spiritual growth that God has for me in community, I would have been removed from the whole and just been one individual part. It's a powerful concept. We are called to continue his legacy and I realize that community is tough. We, can ex we experience the fear of rejection. If I go into community, are people going to accept me for who I am? Are they going to realize I have flaws or the way I look? Or are they not going to welcome me? Am I going to feel like an outsider? I'm going to close with saying this. Any time we make anything about us, it's going to fall flat on its face. It's not going to work. As a matter of fact, if, if we walk into community with the need of affirmation and for people to respond to us and love me, love me, love me, accept me, accept me, that's not going to work. If we go into community with, I'm going to love you, I'm going to serve you, I'm going to lay down my life like Christ laid down his life for the church, that will work. Jesus had to lay down his life to establish the church. We are called to lay down our lives to continue its building and its construction. Does that make sense? Amen. So today we have uh, several community group leaders that will be over here and uh, they'll have lanyards on and you can talk to them about joining community. This is an amazing invitation to step in to God's plan and purpose for you, your family, to grow and thrive in the kingdom and see the glory of God be made manifest in your lives. Let's all stand. So Father, we thank you for your word, the challenge that you have given to us, Lord and the power of your presence here as we engage your word and your will for our lives, Lord. We bless you and thank you, Father, for this invitation into your kingdom family, into your plan and your purpose for our lives, into this rock vision, God. And we bless you, Lord, and thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name, somebody say it. Amen. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. Praise the Lord.